Good evening, John. Thank you for your right. patience. Um, very well, thank you. Uh, before we talk about your career, I've been personally really excited to reconnect. It's been far too long, and and um, yeah, I, I probably will probably go in a bit more detail. May I ask how, how long have we got out of interest? Because we we just for just for just for I know you like your schedule. Um, I do. I do. Uh, <laughs> We've got half an hour at least, right? Half an hour. Half an hour. That's good. As long as, half an hour, as long as a half an hour, like the, the sun's out in Britain. But look I know. At look at, this is my office. It's ridiculous right now. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do is look, um, if you have any questions for John, he's got a remarkable journey. I'm probably going to have to share my experience of how I got connected with John five years ago um, as a mentee. I don't know if you can remember those days in my pinstripe suit, um, but. Honestly, if you have any questions with regards to the session, put a question in the comment section and we want, you know, I'll bring them on board and I hope you enjoy this session as much as I have. John, would you mind explaining to the live audience around the world who you are, what you really specialise in with regards to psychology, but also in the past with regards to professional sport? All right. So my name's John Amici. I'm an organisational psychologist nowadays. <laughs> I used to play some basketball, um, and I don't do much of that anymore. Uh, a bit of mild yoga is the best you can get out of me. Uh, I'm actually not that involved in, in sports, unlike many of your other guests that I've been peeking in on today. I, uh, I probably dip in and out of sports at, the, at its worst possible moments, because I'm usually only called when sport does something stupid. Um, it's like I'm the unwelcome ethical conscience. I'm the Jiminy Cricket on the shoulder of sport, reminding it what it's supposed to stand for, uh, reminding it sport what it's supposed to be when we take the duty of care of athletes at the heart, when we, when we use science to help people advance but not to, to discriminate, as we've seen. Um, I don't know. I mean, all of this is self-appointed because sport – rarely wants to hear what I have to say, I think, uh, because I'm a bit of a busybody. But I just think it's it's such a shame that sport, it promises so much and delivers often, when you think of organized sport, so little, uh, especially when you think of some of the people out there who are doing remarkable things in their communities for small groups of people, but they can't find the connectedness and the support that they need. So I try and make a difference uh, as much as I can um, otherwise, I'm, I mean, I'm a director of a national health uh, service trust. So as you can imagine at the moment. Yeah, very busy. I'm, I'm a little busy, yeah. And just with regards to your psychology journey, could you just provide an insight? Uh, I know I can still remember our podcast chat with your inspiration of your mother in regards to helping mm -hmm. people. Would you mind just sharing this little side of the journey of yeah. the current work you're doing now? Sure. So I knew I'd be a psychologist when I was seven. That was when I, well before I considered any sport, uh, because I am at heart a geek and a nerd. Those are the two most important things to know about me. And I wanted to, um, I watched my mother, uh, who was a doctor, a GP, a general practitioner, and I watched how she interacted with patients. And it became very clear to me that the important thing of what she did was not not the medicine, not the kind of nitty gritty technical but it was this this strange and amazing interpersonal power that she had to make people feel a sense of resolve to feel like they could cope in the midst of tragedy to feel like they could heal um when they were really really sick uh and that was her that was that was to me that was magic um to me that was like being a jedi that was like you know that's why i have my my yoda right here um and and that was what made me want to be a psychologist, to be someone who, using their words and the power of their mind at their best, can help people to thrive. And that's what I was interested in. Um, I ended up studying marriage and family therapy uh, for my master's, and then my doctorate was organizational psychology. And so now uh, that's the work that I do mostly with, with big organizations, some of them in healthcare, most of them in business. Just with regards to your interest in psychology, when we last spoke, we talked about how people can transition psychology into a career. Out of interest, related to your career development, 
how have you seen psychology have such an impact in the way we're living now? Well, I mean, especially right now, people are realizing that whilst we're in the middle of, an, of, of, a, of a health crisis, a, 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 a pandemic, that one of the impacts that people are really starting to feel is the mental health impact. So even if you are not yourself a victim of the virus, you haven't got the virus, whether they were mild, or asymptomatic or otherwise, you find yourself in these new circumstances confined in our lovely prisons, turning our homes from something that we love to come back to into something that we can't wait to leave. And that, that change um, of mentality around the space that was your rock can really shake a person. And so this is just another example. It's a crisis, so obviously lots of different things come into play, but psychology comes into play here. But in the everyday, you know, psychology is is not just, it's not the study of the human mind, really. It's the, it's it's helping, it's the study of how the human mind interacts with other minds and the world around it, how it copes and manages, how it thrives. And that's why I'm interested in it, because I, I want to help people thrive, whatever they do. And just with regards to going back to the sport element, today's International Day for Sport Development and Peace. For once, because there's no live sport around the world, how have you seen the enjoyment of actually acknowledging peace and sport development from your perspective out of interest? Um, I mean, I think I think that at the moment we're in the kind of prurient stage of yeah. missing sports where it's just people want to get their bum out of seat in a stadium or they want to get on their couch and watch the NBA finals or whatever it is. And and I, I think I think when people I actually think when people go back to sport, that's when they'll suddenly realize what else it gave them, that it wasn't just entertainment. When they sit with their friends on their couch, arguing playfully about their favorite player, they suddenly realize that that sport is facilitating this relationship, this friendship. When they are in the stands and they weep when the opposition scores and a stranger next to them puts their arm around them and tells them it'll be okay. I think that's when suddenly we're going to realize the potential that sport has. Again, I can't emphasize enough. It doesn't always or even often live up to it. But when it's done right, it gives, especially men, but lots of people, permission to feel, permission to show and express their feelings in a way that they perhaps don't get to do because of stupid socialization regularly. It gives, you know, people who are perhaps oftentimes find themselves confined to their home or busy with work or stressed, this outlet that's always connected, often connected to other people. I just think it's it can be tremendous. I think so too. And like, this is why I mentioned it, because as you said, you, you said earlier, you brought to the occasion to speak on topics of sport when you know, from your perspective and just from today, our theme throughout the whole day is all about upskilling people's skill sets at home and using their time wisely. And we're not just talking students here. We've got we've had advice from a parent perspective, uh, mm -hmm. how they can interact with their children during this time. With regards to your area of expertise, with the parent side of things, what tips would you give with regards to how we can cope better? And as you say, in these luxurious prisons, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, I think I, I would probably start um, not where people would expect, which is to say, I think in these times, parents will mostly want to deliver for their kids. And as such, they will forget the one thing that will enable them to do that sustainably, which is taking care of themselves. Parents, when, when you're sequestered like this, I've been talking to a number of my clients just about you know, their mental state and how they're doing. And and you suddenly realize that they are so focused on their kids, homeschooling, keeping them entertained, keeping them moving and fit, that they've forgotten about their own relationship with their partner. They've forgotten about the self-care, the idea that, I'm sorry, I need an hour in the morning before they wake up where I don't talk to anybody. I need my tea in the garden alone. And, and I think that's where I would start for people, self-care. And that's not being selfish. It's so that you have the resilience to last the rest of the day so that you can uh, have something to look forward to after a tough day. And it doesn't always have to be wine. That's a great point. Just have you, your 
routine. I'm going to say that you've been the last, gosh, I don't know how many days in a row, but some brilliant Jedi two-minute videos you've been sharing about this whole progression, but in a very authentic way. So with regards to what you said about self-care, how have you applied self-care to the line of work you do, but also making sure you, you, you stay in, insane if that makes sense so yeah yeah um so i mean i've been i've been rather generous to myself i think I, I normally work through weekends and this weekend i took the weekend off i'm very very privileged in that i have outside space in my house so i, I don't have to like many londoners i wasn't trapped inside my house so i enjoyed the sun i sat out and and i listened to music and it was amazing um the other thing that I'm doing actually that's more related to, to this sport is that um, I got really, really big after I finished playing uh, basketball. I just ate everything. Uh, and recently I've lost a huge amount of weight. And so what I've done instead, and now I'm, I'm taking care of myself by exercising regularly. Bit of yoga, a bit of lightweight elderly pensioner hit workout type stuff. And that's the thing that, that's the thing that enables me to stay resilient when my my clients really need me and, and more than that when my friends really need me would you mind just sharing to listeners your two minute videos the one i would like for you to elaborate on as well is you did a great piece on anxiety but you said it in a, a way that could relate to that can relate to people in their day-to-day -day lives would you mind just talking about these little videos you've been doing as well yeah no i've been loving these we, we call them jedi reflections because i'm a geek and um uh so, I mean, I, I actually don't remember. Was that like a few days ago? Probably. Everything is just kind of a blur. Oh, no, no, I agree. I think it was four days ago. And yeah, it was, yeah, four days. I think it was Thursday last week. Something about that. Got about you. four days. So essentially what I'm trying to do is when, when I, people message me all the time on social media and, and, uh, and when they do, I try and speak to the things that they're talking about succinctly i mean i i have few remaining talents one of them is a is that i'm usually able to string a, a sentence together pretty well and so you know at this time anxiety is is going to be one of the big dangers obviously the virus is a danger but anxiety is a big danger as well and you've got to find ways to relieve that and so uh, one one of the things i suggested was the idea that you do a two-minute check-in that you just, you, you think about people who you haven't connected with, or oftentimes we have that thing, right, where we, in the course of our day, we'll think, oh, yeah, I must talk to such and such. And you pretend that you're going to log that in your brain somewhere, and then it's gone. And then six months later, you have the same thought again. And so what I said was, when you have those thoughts in a time like this, write the name down, and then commit to nothing else but two minutes, just two minutes. You call up, you say, look, I've only got two minutes. I was thinking about you and I just wanted to check and make sure you're all right. And the thing is, people think this is all about the person you're calling, but it isn't. This is a way so. for us to stay connected for ourselves as well in the midst of isolation. And for those people who are uh, quarantined with their children and with their partner and maybe with some extended family who can find no peace, a moment locking yourself into the bathroom to make that call can give you a bit of space from the environment that you're in too. And I think we've just got to be more generous with ourselves and reach out to other people as well. I'm just going to relate this to Alistair McCaw earlier. He said, do daily goals and one goal for your mindset, one goal for your, um, your mental state and one for um, relationships. Mm -hmm. And that relationship one is just connection. So, this is why we've loved this. We've had so much knowledge from great people, and I wanted to add that in. And the one thing I've admired, um, if you don't mind, I have to share the story of how I connect with you because we've we've had a topic about mentors. And I don't know if you can remember, but when we met at Benchmark, uh, I gave this cup of tea over my head. Um, literally, mentorship. I reached out with this long email saying it was like doing a two pointer, and. Um, Thankfully, I've, I've, we've talked about mentors today and I've been grateful to have John take me under his wing right from the start with my podcast idea, Education to Sport. And I want to say publicly thank you, but I also want you to share the power of mentors that have influenced you and having mentees, if, if that's cool with you, from yeah. your career journey. Yeah, I, I mean, I've been talking a lot about what makes what makes 
a society civilized and what makes people civilized and and one of them is the is the willingness to inconvenience on the possibility of enhancing the life of someone else uh, and and that i mean not only does that describe the current moment right now where we should yeah. be inconveniencing ourselves by staying at home so that our nhs frontline workers so that our key workers can do their jobs more easily and for less time under this stress but it's it's also true when it comes to, to mentoring, the idea that you put yourself at what might seem a little inconvenience because it's time that you now don't have for yourself or for your business because you're donating it to somebody else. Or rather, I think, investing it in someone else. Um, and I think that, to me, has always, has always reaped evidence. It, it always has. And, and not always has it come back in a kind of, oh, aren't you great kind of way, because I don't think that's the expectation with mentoring. But I, it does come back in a kind of um, legitimate joy in watching the progress, success, uh, and, and, and kind of rocket-fueled uh, ascension of somebody else. Even when you know that your hand in it was really marginal, there's a brilliant ad on TV right now that's about um going to the moon and how it, it lists how yes the person who made the, the the engine the batteries who worked out the calculations it's really cool but it even talks about the person who's sweeping up the rubbish and it's like i know that as a mentor i have absolutely played the role of the man sweeping up the rubbish no, <laughs> i knew you're gonna say that <laughs> it, it's not it's not always i'm not saying no, always, no. but but often it is because yeah. that's what I'm good at. I'm good at clearing out the clutter so people can think clearly on their own. And I think there's a real pleasure in watching the success and just knowing that there was there was my fingertip in that. Well, it was more at the like we Amy. I, I don't know if you saw bits with Amy, but you know we were talking about how she uh, Charlotte was her mentor and she was on this uh, program as well, Summit and. For me, going back in time, like oh, I was nervous. I, I remember the first ad, the pinstripe suit, and met at your place. And what I'm, I'm going to share with people, what John did for me, he did clear the clutter, but he didn't give me answers. He gave me better questions, and I left with actually probably twice as much questions, and I had answers. But that's where the real mentoring is. And I, again, I, I wanted to share the process because I think a lot of people. Hopefully I wasn't like this, John, but a lot of people reach out, ask, 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 but actually it's more figure out, figure out. And then if you're struggling, then ask a better question. And you've, as I said, you've been more than the the, the sweeper bloke and you've been more than a little uh, finger for me because it, it gave me confidence. And I think this is what I want to share with people getting a mentor. It's having that confidence. But another thing I'd like to touch on as well, which I keep learning from you all the time, from your videos, uh, from your speeches is, would you mind just sharing some tips of public speaking? Because you have an art at it. It's just natural to you. Would you mind just sharing the power of having a good brand, which sort of relates to having a good message with public speaking? Well, you you can have a you can have a sneak preview of an upcoming video. It's it's on my I'm, I, as well as being quite digital. I have three screens in front of me. I'm still very much on paper. <laughs> but I was thinking about this the other day, and and because people ask me about it, I'm not a Public speaking broadly, there are better public speakers. Storytellers in speaking, I'm all right right there. I, I, would, I, would, I, might, make, <laughs> I might make an all-star thing for that. But I think the, the, the way I would describe it is this, is that people think that storytelling is about filling in every single detail, about, about illustrating um, a picture with such detail. But you, that's not it, actually because that's distracting. It leaves an audience staring around them at all times, totally distracted. Great storytelling is knowing exactly where you want to take people and some sense of how you want them to feel. And then what you do is you actually take them on a more like a, a city center bus tour. You get them on the bus, hopefully it's a sunny day, and you sit them on the top and that's your audience. And you are the one with the microphone. And you're not just saying, here, here's London, here's Paris, and saying, oh, isn't that amazing? No, no, no. What you're doing is looking at them with such focus and presence that they are staring at you. And then you say, 
this right here is something you need to pay attention to. And everybody looks at that and you describe a little bit about that and then you bring them back and you say, now, now, as we move on, this right here. Because people can't take in a thousand different points, even if it is amazing. They just need three or four things that have an emotional, a psychological hook. And you, storytellers do that well by not just taking them through the most interesting journey, but making sure that they point out the bits that they're supposed to take away with them. So if they remember nothing else of this tour, you remember these three key moments. And at the destination, you feel this sense of kind of, I've seen everything, even though all you saw was those three things. That's storytelling. Look, if you're watching this live, I hope you enjoyed that little piece because the one that always comes to mind, you did a lovely keynote where you talked about, you know, somebody remembering their name just on the simplest things. It's, it sort of relates to how we're living now, doing the phone call, being mindful, just reconnect with people we haven't seen. So just on that note, one thing I just want to talk about from the last time we spoke about a few years ago, mm -hmm. how have you kept on evolving yourself uh, from a business standpoint, but also you as a person? I think the most useful tool for anybody who's got real aspiration is introspection. I know people think it's like looking at the future, looking at a million pounds, two million, 10 million, whatever it is, some kind of figure, some position or title. I think it's about looking at yourself and saying, how well do I know me? Uh, and, and I think having that sense of groundedness helps you avoid making big screw ups but also it helps you navigate the world around you. So I've been, I've always been a person who does a fair amount of work on introspection to know who I am, how I'm feeling, how is that changing over time? Are my desires for the future shifting? And if they are, what does that mean for how I'm behaving, for where I'm taking my business? But really importantly, I, I know the gaps. I know the bits that I'm terrible at. I always tell people, I tell my clients, I am very deep and very narrow. There are lots of things I know about very few things. I would not wander into um, you know, a conversation about real estate. I would not wander into a conversation about physics with Brian Cox, but I'll stand my own in my particular area of psychology or two or three of those areas of psychology and not beyond. And then I'm always really good at knowing, do I need to fill this gap? Or do I need to find someone else to fill this gap? Is this something that I would benefit from learning about? Or is this best done by bringing somebody brilliant in? So business development has never been my number one thing, but I know how crucial it is. So I've got somebody in who does an amazing job with that. Um, and I think that kind of introspection, it keeps you grounded. It keeps you honest. And it helps you not to sabotage yourself. It helps yeah. you not to get to that point where you make that, why do I always do that? People who ask that question of themselves, why do I always do that? And it's because you're sabotaging yourself. And if you understood a bit more about yourself, you would feel it coming and be able to say, is this really what I want? I, I received an email today from a, a board that I sit on and it was not flattering. And, um, and I had a decision to make about it. And there's lots of people who, when they get that kind of email, they're like, right, I'm going to write the meanest thing back. I'm going to make sure everybody knows how I feel. And, and I know that that's a temptation, that little flare of heat. And because I know myself, I'm like, right, that email goes away. I will not deal with this for another three days. And then I will send something measured because I want, I have a picture of what I want in the future. And I'm not going to let me get in the way of that. So out of interest, how what's that first step with regards to this self-sabotage? Like people at home, they're going to have good days and they're going to have probably more bad days. And so how what's that first step of is it acknowledgement first and then put something in place as like a process? Uh, what's your thoughts on that? If that makes you've sense. Be, yeah, it does. I think you, you've got to be able to see it coming. So most people have never thought about the feelings, the emotions, the, the internal narrative that happens before they do something really stupid, right? Yeah. And so you can have that conversation. And, it, and honestly, it doesn't matter whether it's um, you're planning on skipping training. Mm -hmm. And you've had the thought the moment you wake up in the morning and you put it away and then you have the thought again and it seems less bad and then you keep, and before you know it, three o'clock comes around and you skip training. 
And and you can you can shortcut that by saying to yourself, the first time you have that thought in the morning, this is where it starts. This is where that sabotage starts. And so I won't do that. I'm going to do this instead. I'm going to bring training up earlier in the day. I'm going to call a friend and tell them I've just had that thought that makes me want to skip training. Can you give me a bell later on to make sure I'm coming? You can put your bag together, your training kit together, and leave it right by the front door so you don't have that excuse, oh, I've got to go and get my stuff together. Yeah. There's all kinds of things you can do as long as you know yourself what are the things that lead up to those bad decisions? It's the same if you're trying to lose weight. What makes you eat that cake? All of these things live in the same world. Look, thank you so much for that. I'm just going to whack on a comment for Pablo, uh, you know, of this discussion so far. And also, we've actually got... Um, Pablo? We've got uh, this as well, just from... Thank you so much for supporting the event, everybody. Like, this is what it's all about. And uh, look, John... I am super mindful and look, I'm grateful for you being here. Out of interest, how can people interact with you on social media? <laughs> Luckily or unluckily for the people watching, I am prolific on social media. So you can catch me on Twitter where I'm a regular polemicist. So at John Amici, so just my name as it's written on the screen, all one word. You can catch me on Instagram. It's John Amici OBE. It's not because I'm posh, it's just because Somehow they wouldn't let me have John Amici. Um, on YouTube, Amici Performance, so my last name and performance, all one word. And on LinkedIn, you just put in my name and it's these this face with these glasses. You'll find me. That is great. To all listeners listening in, we'll put the YouTube channel in the comment section of this feed because, honestly, these videos, they keep me going. Like every morning when I go for my walk, I just have a quick listen. As he said, have that two-minute bit to myself and then I hit the day hard but John thank you again I really appreciate your time and uh, this is why we did this event it's to reconnect people in the sports industry and most of the people people can learn at home so we are super grateful if you would like to share your uh, biggest takeaway from John please put your comment below or go to Twitter uh, maybe tag John as well and put spirit of sport and and uh, look uh, on that note John thank you again and have a great rest of your evening uh, well done. Well done. This is this is a remarkable achievement. Well done. Man.